I want to welcome everyone to our first webinar through Sinai and Synapses as part of our series, Learning from Scientific Experts for the Yamim Noraim. My name is Rabbi Jeff Middleman. I am the founding director of Sinai and Synapses, which bridges the worlds of religion and science, and it's incubated at CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. This is the first of a series of webinars for rabbis to gain some scientific knowledge for you to use in your sermons and your communications and your questions and your decisions leading up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I know I, I was a pulpit rabbi for, for seven years that you all are being forced to do a whole host of unexpected and unprecedented tasks right now. And sometimes people are looking to you for guidance on topics that you are not actually an expert in. So you're still not going to be an expert in these after these webinars, but hopefully you'll be able to get a little more grounding for your teaching and your preaching and conversations in the best science we have right now. So our, uh, our, our hope is that we're gonna give you some ways to think about not just the how questions, but also the what questions, that how questions of how are you going to plan to reopen? How are you envisioning the next few months? How are you going to rethink what the high holy days are going to look like? Along with what you want to share when you deliver your Divrei Torah or your sermons and your other messages with your community. Uh, that's also why we're recording this conversation and we're going to have a transcription afterwards so that you can use it to quote uh, in any sermons that you might give or share with others and other lay leaders as well. So it's now, today it's July 2nd, 2020. Our communities, almost all of our synagogues have been almost completely closed to in-person gatherings for, uh, for us for at least over three months. And, uh, and it looks like it's gonna be that way for a while. And even the in-person meetings that we're having are having a minimal number of in-person interactions and a maximal amount of precaution, that wonderful phrase that we heard and used of, out of an abundance of caution. Uh, and nearly all of us have been making this decision due to our value of pikuach nefesh, of saving a life. That's a phrase that I know all of us have been using and thinking about. But I think even more than that, we've been ma making our decisions based on safek, out of, out of doubt, because our sages realized that even when there is doubt uh, surrounding pikuach nefesh, we should act in a way that probably violates other halakhic principles in order to save a life. But with COVID-19, we're living with so much more safek than the rabbis dealt with when they wrote all these responsa. Uh, counterintuitively, it's because we have so much more knowledge than the rabbis have, because we have so many more sources of knowledge, not all of which is accurate. Even if it is accurate, it might be conflicting. We wanna obviously create the most meaningful, spiritual, inspiring high holy days that we can, while we're still at the same time trying to figure out who has COVID-19? Who can catch it? Who can spread it? Who's symptomatic? Who's asymptomatic? Who's pre-symptomatic? What's a reasonable risk? What can we do to minimize that risk? What's the risk that we're willing to take on? It's not as simple as saving a single life is saving the entire world. We are really grappling with some really complicated questions with a lot of different competing sources of information here. So you all are grappling and struggling with all of these questions of risks, what the risks are right now, what the risks might look like in two months, what your community needs, what your financial situation is going to look like, how your lay people are acting or not acting. And I think the challenge is that we as rabbis can easily see multiple sides of an issue. We really celebrate the, uh, the elu ve elu, these and these are the words of the living God. And we love the studying and the back and forth and the on the one hand and on the other hand and the joke about the two people who say, you're right, and you're right. Well, how can they both be right? You know what? You're right. We, we really love that process, but at the end of the day, we have to make a ruling and we have to act on it. We need a psak halakha. We need a decision. As uh, when we had our pre-meeting with, uh, with our speakers here that I'm going to introduce in a few minutes, uh, they said, you can't go 80% outside. We need to make a decision and we need to do it with a whole lot of incomplete or changing information along with competing values and different perspectives among your own values and what your president is pushing for and what your board wants and what your incredibly diverse community as a whole is looking for. So I wanna be very clear this afternoon that we're not going to give you a psak halakha. We are not going to tell you what to do because 
none of us are epidemiologists and also none of us are working in your specific community with your specific constituents and your specific guidelines. Instead, our goal, and to learn from these two incredible speakers and presenters, is to help you think about some of the questions you can be asking, and also give some resources to think about and use as jumping off points. So hopefully there are gonna be some thoughts and ideas that you can use to talk about these risks versus rewards in a way that's both a very traditional rabbinic way of thinking by holding multiple competing truths and values, along with what you all are doing as a modern rabbi, offering up hope and inspiration and comfort to your community. So before I introduce our guest speakers, I need to thank a few of our partners here. First, I need to thank our program administrator, Sinai and Synapses program administrator, Rachel Pincus, and also our rabbinic publicity partners, CLAL and the CCAR and the RA and the RRA, I also need to thank the people who have supported Sinai and Synapses, including some of our donors who I believe are on as well, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the world's largest scientific organization. They also have the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. They have been our programmatic partner uh, for many, many years, and they help ensure that we are everything that we are doing is grounded in the best, most accurate science that we have. And also need to thank the John Templeton Foundation, which has been our primary funder for many of our programs about Judaism and science. You should also know that through the John Templeton T Foundation and our donors, Sinai and Synapses has an open application right now for a grant for your community for $3,600 to do work on Judaism and science. And the deadline for that is July 23rd. Happy to talk about that as well. So in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to our two speakers who are going to present for about 10 to 15 minutes. And you can ask questions throughout the chat. Uh, we're gonna ask you to stay muted throughout the conversation, but to stay uh, muted throughout the chat. And we're gonna try to respond to as many as we can. But these two speakers, these two presenters have been incredible science communicators. They have been interviewed and, and talked about and talked to in a lot of different places. You've actually probably read and heard uh, both of their work here. And I'm really excited to be able to learn from them because they can talk about this question of risks and rewards in a world of unknowns, they can talk about it intelligently and clearly and with deep intellectual humility. And so I am very excited to introduce our two speakers. First, we're gonna hear from Professor Emily Oster, who is a professor of economics at Brown University. She holds a PhD in economics from Harvard. Prior to being at Brown, she was on the faculty at the University of Chicago Booth School. Dr. Oster's academic work focuses on health economics and statistical methods. She is interested in understanding why consumers don't always make rational health choices, which is something that we're dealing with right now. And aside from her two books aimed at parents entitled Expecting Better and Crib Sheet, most relevant for our work right now, she is the creator and curator of the site COVID Explained, which is made up of a team of researchers and students at Brown, MIT, Harvard, Mass General, and elsewhere. And we'll send you the link for that as well. And then after she presents, we're going to hear from Professor Stuart Firestein, who is the former chair of the Columbia University Biolo Department of Biological Sciences. Dedicated to promoting the accessibility of science to a public audience, Dr. Firestein serves as an advisor to the Alfred, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation's Program for the Public Understanding of Science. Dr. Firestein's commitment to engaging the public in science can be seen in his TED Talk entitled, The Pursuit of Ignorance, which has garnered two million views and counting. And he's written two books on the workings of science for a general audience, Ignorance, How It Drives Science, and Failure, Why Science is So Successful. So I am thrilled to be able to turn it over to Professor Oster to explore some of these questions about risks and rewards and how we can think about and talk about these kinds of questions. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm, I'm super excited to be here and hopefully I can be, uh, be a little bit helpful on this. Um, so as, uh, as Jeff said, I'm a professor at, at Brown. I'm an economist. Um, I work a lot on, um, on health stuff and I write on parenting and, and pregnancy and increasing this, uh, in this period on COVID. Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot about decision making and how uh, how people can make decisions, how sort of larger groups can make um, can make decisions. So, um, so I thought I would just um, sort of overview a little bit, kind of how I'm thinking about decision making. And and I know like a lot of you had some some sort of pretty specific questions, and I think uh, it could be fun at some point to to sort of talk about some of those as as you might run them through this this kind of framework. So uh, so I want to talk about 
uh, how to decide. And so, you know, I think part of what for me has been really challenging about this, uh, the pandemic is just like the incredible uncertainty that uh, that has sort of pervaded uh, all of our, our decisions. So, um, so we're kind of all facing a lot of choices that we don't uh, that we don't expect and that we didn't expect to be uh, to be facing uh, and not choices that other people have um, have sort of made before, not situations in which other people have, have experienced uh, before. And so I think, you know, for, for, for you, um, I would guess that, you know, you as a, as a, um, as a rabbi are facing a bunch of, of decisions. Um, so things like, should we have services in what way, uh, in, in what way should people wear masks? Should they wear no masks? Should they sit every other seat? Should, you know, should we have pods in our services? What would that even mean? Should we limit who can come? Should we tell the older you know, people, older people in our congregation they can't come? Of course, those may be the people who would benefit the most uh, from, from seeing their um, from seeing their their seeing you, hearing what you have to say. So I think those those are the kind of uh, those are the kind of things that you're probably thinking through. And then at the same time, you're facing that one. Uh, at the same time, you're you're facing people who want answers from you and their families who have, and these are the kinds of questions that I'm getting all the time, you know, well, I'm, should I send my kids to school? Should they see their relatives? Should they see their grandparents? When should they see their grandparents? Well, should we eat out? Is it okay for us to see our friends? Can we go to services? Can we shop for, for groceries? And, and there are sort of all of these questions are kind of around and they're sort of overwhelming in their frequency and their difficulty. Um, and the kind of simple point that I'm trying to make in a lot of the writing that I'm doing uh, is that everyone is facing a different set of these decisions. And even among the people whose question is, should my kid go to daycare uh, or should I have services? The, the choice, the sort of frame of that decision is totally, uh, is totally different. The circumstances are totally different. So if, you know, if, uh, if your congregation is in Houston, you're facing a very different situation than if your congregation is in Providence, at least this week. Maybe that will be different next, uh, next month. If you uh, are a family and you have an immune compromised parent at home, and your kid is going to go to daycare. It's a very different situation than if you don't have if you don't have that. People face different financial circumstances. Can I afford to stay home with my kids? Do I need to send them to childcare so I can work? There are a lot of things that are laying around top of this. And so the kind of frame the like headline that I keep just telling people and saying over and over again is like you don't need an answer. You need a way to decide because giving you an answer even for your very specific question right in this moment. That's not gonna be the right answer maybe even tomorrow or next week or certainly not in, in September when you face kind of choices around, um, around Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So what you need is a way to decide in the moment when you have to make the decision. And so I'm gonna give you kind of a quick like five-step process for kind of how you might start thinking about this um, and the hopes that maybe it's, it's a little helpful. So, um, so there are five steps, let's talk about them. So the first thing, uh, first thing that I sort of argue people should do is frame their question. So often people's questions are too vague. So they say, what should I do? What should I do is not a question with a concrete answer. Uh, a question with a concrete answer is, should I hold services on this date or not? Or should I hold services with my full congregation or with half my congregation? Or should I send my kid to daycare now or in two months? And the reason that it's so useful to frame that question is because then when you go into thinking about mitigating risk and all these sort of later steps, you're actually thinking about, is it A or is it B? If your question is just, what should I do? Well, how would I think about the risk of that if I don't know whether, if I don't know what the, what the alternative is, it's hard for me to think about how, uh, it's hard for me to, to think about the question. So I think often people are not, um, are kind of not appropriately framing the question that makes it hard to that makes it hard to answer. Once you have the question, I think the sort of obvious next step is to think about how you can do things as, as safely as possible. So sort of sort of take a, a very specific example. You imagine the question is, you know, should I open, you know, should I open for services or not? And before you think about kind of how how big a risk is that, you want to think about what's the safest way to do that. How can I most effectively mitigate risk? And there, I think, you know, there's a fair amount of guidance. And as, as Jeff said, I, you know, I run a website that has a, like a lot of information about this. The CDC can be pretty good for this. But just sort of thinking about in your circumstance, is it possible for you to, uh, is it possible for, for you to, uh, to socially distance your, your congregation? Is it possible for everybody to wear 
masks, you know, certainly you should do that if, uh, if, if you can. And so there are some sort of simple things there. Can you put hand sanitizer in? Like, what can you do to make this as safe as possible? Once you have thought about what's the safest way, the safest possible way to do this, you actually did need to think about how big the risk is. So is it, what is the chance given the overall congregation, given the AI congregation, given their demographic risk, given how much disease there is in my area, actually try to evaluate like what's the chance someone will get very sick. And that number is gonna be really different. Uh, if your congregation is a bunch of 25 year olds, than if your congregation is a bunch of 85 year olds. Uh, and it's going to be really different if the prevalence in your area is 1% or the prevalence in your area is 10%, right? And so you want to, there's a sort of, th those are just numbers. You could sort of say, how large is the risk? What's the share of people in this area who are infected? What is the risk, the fatality risk, the hospitalization risk for my, uh, for my congregation? Even if I do things as safely as possible, there's going to be some risk. But there are going to be some benefits too, and I think that this is, a piece that we are missing in a lot of these conversations is that there are real benefits to bringing people together, to doing in-person uh, in-person services, or to send your kid to daycare, or to uh, seeing seeing your grandparents. Um, and you know, I think we really those are very personal, but they're they're something that that we kind of really have to have to think about. And, and the final step is, you know, we're going to weigh the cost and the benefits um, and decide. And there's going to be some decision, and it's not like to sort of say decide there, I think people are telling me, well, that's kind of facile and that's right. Like it's, it, it is a little facile to say, well, you weigh the costs and benefits, you decide, you know, how do I weigh this risk of a seriously ill or God forbid a, a death among a, a congregant? How do I weigh that against the joy that people will experience from being together? Or how do I weigh this serious disease risk to my parents against the joy from seeing their grandkids? Unfortunately, that is the choice that you have to, to make. And so the fact that it is a hard choice is, it, there is there is no not choosing. There is no choice to not choose. And you're gonna have to make a choice knowing that there is going to be residual uncertainty. And then I think the last piece of this um, is, is I think important to just, to just sort of try to make these choices and move forward. I think particularly when we sort of go back to um, this question of like there's so much uncertainty I think one of the things that means is we're constantly just revisiting and revisiting and revisiting these choices in our heads, but, uh, but we can't do that um, because we have, there's another choice coming down, coming down the line. So I think we really do have to try to discipline to make the choice and then move, uh, and then move forward. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that piece kind of making the choice and, and moving forward, that's a piece of conquering uncertainty. And let me just sort of like say two, two other things and then I'll stop. So, um, so when I think about, I, I write a lot about parenting and, and pregnancy and people often ask me, you know, well, do you think this is sort of like being a new parent? It's kind of like overwhelming and like a lot of people are yelling at you and you're stuck in your house. Um, is that, and, and I think there's a piece of that that's kind of like that, right? It has that sort of a little bit of that, of that feel of like every day there's a new crazy decision I didn't think of. Um, I think the difference is that when you're a new parent, you kind of look out at the world and there's all these people who like already did it. And you know, like, okay, eventually I'm gonna, you know, a lot of people have managed to raise a four-year-old, I'm gonna kind of get there. And here, there aren't a lot of people who have sort of thrived through the viral pandemic and come out on the other end. I think that's what's, that's what's particularly, um, that's what's particularly hard. Um, and I, I, you know, I think in terms of like how to, how to kind of process this, the, I think the other piece of advice I've often been giving people is trying not to think too far ahead, that it's, of course, you have to do some advanced planning, but thinking about, you know, what's Rosh going to look like in 2021, like, don't spend any time on that, because there's no way to predict that right now. You know, there are plenty of things to try to, like, figure out in the next six weeks, uh, and you don't need to sort of be thinking about 18 months, uh, 18, 18 months up. And final thing is just, I think, you know, we're, we're all going to have to really accept, and I think this will sort of uh, move a little bit into what Stuart's going to say, but I think there's a sense in which we accept that, like, there's a lot of uncertainty here and not obvious um, and and that's unfortunately that's what we're going to live with for a little while and hopefully there will be a vaccine and and some of this stuff will uh will seem a, a distant memory i hope thank you and, and and it's really it's very helpful to be able to to recognize that the specific questions that we're grappling with are going to change and you know we think about what happened in march versus versus may versus july and just not being able to, to know what the future is going to bring. 
Um, and so that's why I'm excited to be able to, to turn it over to Stuart, who actually has a really unique take on what uncertainty and, and as he celebrates ignorance, not the, I'm not gonna listen to experts ignorance, but actually a very valuable sense of, of what it means to not know something. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stuart here to be able to present his work. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with, with everybody. I'll just say briefly that I met Jeff, uh, I don't know now, maybe it's almost 10 years ago when he contacted me because he read this book that I'd written called Ignorance about science and wanted to use some phrases uh, from it in his Yom Kippur sermon, which I was quite flattered by. And I have to say, uh, made my mother extremely happy. So I have since owed him uh, immensely. And so whenever he calls on me, I respond because he really did a mitzvah there, I have to say. Um, I, I have much less prescriptive sorts of things to say, but I'd like to sort of suggest to you that, that in science we welcome uncertainty and that there are great values to it and that these are things that you might communicate to your congregations, to other people, um, and that there is, there is a great deal of optimism to be had in uncertainty. And I know that's a hard sell at the moment, but I'm going to do my best. All right, so this is the beginning of uncertainty, I suppose. This is a haiku from the Japanese poet Basho, very famous, too much mist, can't see Fuji, makes it more interesting. Um, and, and so sometimes, of course, seeing things too clearly, seeing things too perfectly, relieves us of their interest. Uh, they just are what they are. There's nothing more to think about them. And so sometimes it's uncertainty, in fact, that increases interest. I'm going to use a quote from a, a biologist in the early uh, 20th century, J.B.S. Haldane. He was a famous evolutionary biologist who wrote a, a short essay in 1928. And, and in that essay, he said uh, an oft-quoted phrase, not only is the universe queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine. Although I must say, I'm not sure it's queerer than that suit that he's wearing there, but that's another story. So this, this phrase is often taken to mean, and I think uh, incorrectly, it's often taken to mean that we are somehow or another cognitively limited, that, that we can't even begin to imagine how, how queer, how strange the universe is out there. Um, but I don't think that's actually what Holbane meant, because often left off the quote of this is the sentence that preceded it, which is, I have no doubt that in reality, the future will be vastly more surprising than anything I can imagine. And I think what Holbane was really saying is he welcomes this surprise that, that, that the future will be more surprising than anything I can currently imagine in my current cognitive state, in my current um, set of knowledge. But that doesn't mean it won't be imaginable or it won't occur. And indeed, since 1928, I have to say we've imagined some pretty queer things. Uh, quantum particles, nano entities, dark matter, DNA and RNA, which uh, were discovered after 1928, nuclear energy, epigenetics, microbiomes, Viagra. I don't know who saw that coming. And of course, an internet. I mean, remarkably, an internet. So in 1928, it wasn't that people thought any of these things were either likely or unlikely. They hadn't even thought of them. They hadn't even imagined that they were possible. Connecting two computers together, indeed, there weren't really computers, but, but even until 25 years ago, or now 50 years ago, I guess, the idea of connecting two computers together would have seemed as strange as connecting two refrigerators together. And yet now it seems so common to us. And so it's this notion that, um, that the universe is full of surprises and we should welcome these surprises. To use a quote from Shakespeare, well known, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your or our philosophy, depending on which version of Shakespeare you, uh, you pick up. And then one of my favorites is from Douglas Adams in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which some of you will know. And the second of the, the trilogy of four books was actually the, called The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. And in it, he states, um, that's Douglas Adams, who died at the unfortunate age of 49, totally unexpectedly of an aneurysm, um, just popped off. And that was it. So, you know, the unexpected happens. Um, and it says that there is a theory which states that if any, ever anyone ever discovers what exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable than what we currently have. There's a corollary to this because there's another theory which states that this has indeed already happened. And of course, we expected it may yet 
happen again. I'd like to introduce a term that I think would be very valuable to us now. It's a term that I didn't coin, but was coined by the, the dreamy-eyed poet here, John Keats, in a letter to his brother in 1817 called Negative Capability. This may at first sound a little oxymoronic, but I think it's a very valuable trait to, uh, to practice, to, to learn. And, and Keats defined negative capability as, as a, that, that is when a man or person is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. That is this idea of being patient with uncertainty, patient with mystery, and patient with doubt. He felt that this was a critical uh, frame of mind to, to develop because he considered it the ideal creative state for the literary mind. I would say it's the ideal creative state for the scientific mind as well, and indeed maybe the ideal creative state for anyone's mind. But this notion of the world does have uncertainties, the world is full of mysteries, the world is full of doubts, and we should learn to manage that. We should learn to be immerse ourselves in those and enjoy them because this is where creativity comes from. And so this tells us that the unknown is an interesting place, but, but of course there is the, even greater than the unknown, there is the much feared unknown unknown, if you will. That is what we don't even know we don't even know. And many of you in the audience today will remember that this phrase was made famous most recently by Donald H. Rumsfeld, the uh, Secretary of Defense who was responsible for the ill-begotten uh, military adventures in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Um, and in testimony to a Senate uh, hearing about why it went so badly, he said, well, there were some things that we didn't know, of course, and, and that was a problem. But the real problem was there were all these unknown unknowns, the things we didn't even know, we didn't know. Now, we were somewhat roundly criticized and ridiculed for this statement, but it's actually, of course, quite clever. And I'm happy to say he's not the first person to have said it. It had been around for a while, but the earliest remarks that I can find, and certainly those that it would be of interest to us, today were another D.H., not D.H. Rumsfeld, but D.H. Lawrence, the poet, who in a long narrative poem called New Heaven and Earth, written in 1917, which is essentially about the transition from this earthly plane to whatever awaits us in the next plane, post this earthly plane. And he talks about this as the great unknown. And near the end of this lengthy poem, there's a stanza that reads, now here was I, new awakened, of course, at this moment of transition, new awakened with my hand stretching out and touching the unknown, the real unknown, the unknown unknown. And I think that this is both a spiritual idea and a useful idea in our lives today because we are confronted with the unknown unknown. And this virus that we're all dealing with now, of course, that it's not just the unknowns about it, it's not just the uncertainties, but it's the things we don't even know, we don't even know about it and continue to find out each day and, and change our uncertainty in, in unpredictable ways. So we not only have uncertainty, we have unpredictable uncertainty. Could you ask for anything worse? Well, I would say, yes, you could ask for certainty, which in some ways would be worse. I would say certainty can be a problem, and that there is a value in uncertainty and we should begin looking for it now. Of course, there are many areas in our lives where we already value uncertainty. So in games of chance, in uh, games of sp in sporting uh, matches, we don't wanna know the score beforehand or how things will turn out. Even uh, in terms of our own mortality, I don't think many of us would really like to know the exact time and place and date of our death. Um, so, so we have these things called a spoiler alert in which we purposely hide the outcome if it's known so as not to ruin the fun, if you will. Um, now, but of course, these are somewhat different than scientific uncertainty, even though we enjoy them and there's some similarities. But I think there is a fundamental difference because these uncertainties all do finally resolve to some known state. I mean, the, the hand is shown, the bet is either won or lost, the game comes up with a final score, and like it or not, the exact time and date of your death will appear on a certificate somewhere and probably in a book in the synagogue as well. So, so these things will all come to a, to a conclusion. 
this is sort of not true in science, where I think there's a kind of a grander uncertainty, where there may be, in fact, no ultimate solution, no lasting resolution or a guaranteed complete answer, no, in a somewhat loaded phrase, especially with this crowd, no final solution, which we all know is a rather fraught term and one that we, we would not really like to entertain. Um, there's a famous, famous phrase in which says the opposite of a fact is a falsehood but the opposite of a profound truth is often another profound truth. This almost rabbinical sounding um, statement, which echoes a little bit of what Jeff said at the beginning, was actually uttered by Niels Bohr, the famous quantum physicist, as the only way he could understand and describe the universe. And so this notion of keeping two profound truths in our mind at one time, even though they may conflict, is, is one of the great intellectual um, challenges we face and, and, and uh, what we can do. Um, progress, I think, we have to understand lies in uncertainty. Uh, an over-dedication to immutable facts is finally an impediment to progress. Certainty, curiously, breeds pessimism and uncertainty often can bring optimism. Um, it's recently been shown in some psychological studies that one of the symptoms of depression, unexpectedly, is certainty. Now, you might think that's weird because and, and, and counterintuitive because uncertainty seems to create anxiety and difficulties and so forth, psychological difficulties. But it turns out that depressed people suffer from an, over, an overly developed sense, if you will, of certainty. Things will be the way they will. There is nothing to do about it. It's what it is. And so this loss of a sense of agency actually breeds pessimism uh, and certainty breeds a loss of a sense of agency, whereas uncertainty is, is open possibilities. So the question is not so much how we become certain, but how we get on successfully while accepting uncertainty. And I think Emily had some very prescriptive ways of doing that that are very valuable and which science uses too. George Box, a famous engineer, once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so that's what we do. And in science, I think this is a key idea. In science, revision is a victory. And I believe that this should not be limited to science. We have to understand that in life in general, revision is a victory. We don't have things that are immutable and, and true for all time because things change. The more we know, the more we have questions. I'll end with this, this story, uh, an almost Talmudic story. I think of the optimism of the condemned man. It's a story of a condemned prisoner who rather than beg for mercy, asks for a year's reprieve by promising to teach the king's horse to talk within a year. And he's granted that. But that night, a fellow prisoner asks him what possessed him to make such a crazy bargain. Well, he answers, well, look, a lot could happen in a year. The horse might die. The king might die. I might die. Well, who knows? The horse might learn to talk. So the condemned man, I would say as an optimist, because he knows that he cannot predict the things that might work out in the future. The opportunities, the solutions that may arise are simply not available to his current cognitive position, to his current level of knowledge. His optimism actually arises out of insufficient knowledge, out of uncertainty and ignorance. The prisoner is optimistic because he decides to remain open to the possibilities of the future. Possibilities that he, like J.B.S. Haldane, who I began with, cannot imagine, but can yet come true. And so this prisoner is, is optimistic. This is the optimism, I would say, of uncertainty. I'll end here with this obligatory New Yorker cartoon, um, uh, which says that we, you know, we find truth in many places and, and we should get as close as we can to it, but we don't have to have the ultimate truth to, be, to feel that we're, we've been successful. And I'll, I'll end there, and I hope to hear a lot of questions from people about this. Let me stop. That was it was interesting, and 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 by the way, I want to open this up for people. You can type questions in the chat um, as we're as we're talking here, because there's a lot to unpack. And what's striking me, and and I'm assuming that for for most of us who are on the on the call, who are rabbis, who are maybe starting to think about the high holy days, but not quite yet. Um, you know, I, I'm always struck, I've always been struck by the phrase that, that is said both on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is a prayer called Unatana Tokef. And it says, you know, on Rosh Hashanah it is written, and on Yom Kippur it is sealed, who shall be born, who shall die, um, who by fire, who by water, who by plague, who by pestilence. Like there's a whole list of different 
pieces. And then at, at the end, it says, but, uh, but prayer, but, but uh, um, the, the prayer and, and repentance and charity, um, they, 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 they pass away, they, they cancel judgment's severe decree. And it's a, and it's an, it's an uncomfortable reading, but it's something that what I think people are really going to be thinking about this year of what was sort of preordained, what was not preordained. What are the different things of the decision made in March that actually had an impact in May? What are the decisions where we're making, where, where we don't know, was this the right decision? Was this the good decision? And what happens if you did a good process and a bad result? And so how do we, how do we live with that? How do we think about that from both a, a, a more practical perspective and I think also from a more philosophical perspective? How do we, how do we recognize that there, there are so many things that are outside of our control and, and we can try to make the best decision that we can and it still blows up in our face? Emily, do you want to respond to that? Or? No, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I think that's hard. Um, I don't, do you want to respond? Well, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, this is, you know, the, this goes on regularly in the laboratory. I have to tell you the, the best, you know, the best experiments you can think of uh, often don't work. I mean, failure is what happens most of the time, but that's where we learn the most from. So uh, when I say the unknown unknown is the deepest kind of ignorance there is, the, one question is how do you get to the unknown unknown? How do you access the, what you don't know you don't know? And the way you access that, I think, is by failing. And so when we fail, we learn that we didn't know something. We thought we knew something. We did an experiment. This is a scientific perspective, but it's true in many areas of life. You, we don't know something. We do an experiment to find it out, and the experiment fails in some curious way. And so now what we know is, well, there was something we didn't know we didn't know. And we have to go back and rethink this experiment. We have tapped into yet a deeper kind of ignorance, a deeper kind of uncertainty. But it's where the newest and latest discovery will come from. This is certainly true of this virus. We know a lot about viruses, but there's a great deal about this virus, which turns out we don't know. And there's probably still much more about it that we don't even know we don't know. Um, you know, we should recognize from the long view, I think, that plagues are nothing new. Uh, certainly throughout Jewish history, <laughs> there have been plenty of plagues. Um, I mean, both biblical plagues and, you know, the plagues of the ghetto and, and all the rest of that, all the rest of that history. And we've survived them all. Um, the universities are in a panic these days because of the pandemic and what will happen. Will there ever be universities? Will we come out of it? But I like to remind people that universities in the West, at least, are over a thousand years old. And they've been through multiple plagues and pandemics, most of them much worse than this one, in fact. And we still have universities. I think the difficulty in this one, and, and as Emily pointed out, the uncertainty surrounding it is actually the result of how much we, more we know. The reason we're so uncertain about this is that we have so many better questions to ask about it. I mean, it used to be, well, people died, let's burn their bodies. Let's get rid of the bodies quickly. Let's, who knows what, let's say incantations and hope for the best. So we don't do that now. Um, but we don't actually know what the answers entirely are either. We do our best. We get as close to the truth as we can. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a I think that that resonates. I think the other thing is that is that because you know our technologies are are better now and our understanding is better, there's more of a promise of an end, right? So I think there was a you know if you're sort of sitting through the black plague, the the end was just like eventually it was just going to end, and there was kind of no understanding of how you could make that happen more quickly. I think part of what has happened here is you know, we have the okay, there's going to be a vaccine. And so that opens up the possibility of let's wait until there's a there's a vaccine. Of course, we think we have to recognize there's still sort of pieces of uncertainty, um, of uncertainty even around that kind of that kind of ending. Um, there's a question in the chat, which I think closely relates to, to Jeff's question, which is sort of how do you, uh, how do you kind of revisit? How do you think about revisiting decisions and like whether the decision that you made was wrong? Um, and so I think, you know, there, there is a, a space for, for revisiting decisions. Maybe that's like the sixth, the sixth step is sort of like, like there will be a moment at which you may need to, to change your mind or decide that what you, what you were going to do was, was wrong. Um, or what you, what you did was not right. You would want to do it differently the, the next time. And so 
Um, so, you know, I think that there's, um, I think there's a, there's a point after the decision is realized when you want to reflect back on like, you know, we opened this week, was that the right thing to do? So we had services this week. Like, let me think about like, was, you know, should, should we do it next week? Did we learn something from this week that would change our, would change our mind? But I often emphasize that piece about sort of change our, change our mind. Like, did we make the wrong choice? ex ante? I think that's a, that's a particularly important piece of this. So, you know, you, you may open your, your congregations for the, for the high holidays. It may be the right choice. And it may well be the case that someone in your congregation becomes infected with, with COVID-19, no matter how careful, careful you are, that, that may happen. I mean, may happen at the congregation, may happen, may happen somewhere else. And I think that one of the things that has gone on is as we have reopened a bit, whenever we see a case, then there's this sort of moment of like, oh my God, I didn't know that. Like, maybe I, maybe I did this wrong. And I think it's important to sort of step back and say, okay, you should have anticipated that that would happen to some extent. Maybe it is more than you anticipated, but we have to recognize, unfortunately, like we're in the middle of a viral pandemic and some people are going to get sick. And the question is, you know, did you actually make the wrong choice from an ex-ante standpoint, as opposed to just, I wish it had been realized, like the outcome had realized differently. You know, there were a range of outcomes. I wish we had gotten the better outcome, but actually it was the right choice, as opposed to saying, well, actually, you know, we made the wrong choice and we should have done this. So this differently. So I think when when revisiting, that's kind of the piece I would have in mind. You know, was it the wrong choice at CSU or the wrong choice uh, ex ex post? Um, the um, related to that, the uh, world, uh, the first female world champion poker player, Annie Duke, whose books I recommend you if you don't know them, um, lectures on this regularly. And and as she's often said, you know, eighty twenty when the when the risks are eighty twenty and you do the math and it's an eighty twenty positive risk. The trouble is 20% happens, you know, 20% of the time, 20% happens. But, and, and as she said, I've lost a lot of money on 80-20 hands in poker, but I still bet them heavily because 80-20 is a good bet. And so you can't go back and say, well, 80-20, that was a bad bet because I lost it this mm-hmm. time. 20% of the time you will lose it. And, and there's, you know, one has to live with that to some extent, and one has to be careful about revising everything you did just because you lost one hand in an 80-20 bet. So there were a couple of questions that came up that I want to try to join together. One is that we as, as rabbis often love to talk about the, the Agadah and the, and the philosophy and the, the thinking through and, and sort of playing things out, and yet these are decisions that we're going to have to make relatively soon with some very concrete um, impacts and some concrete decisions because the high holidays are coming, whether we want them to want them to come or not, they are coming and they're going to have to be rethought. Can you give an example of, of what might be a way that you would think through um, a, a process where there is a little bit of uncertainty here? I know, Emily, you actually wrote a piece, I think, this this morning about opening schools and, and you know, how did you, know, how did you walk that that through and what happens if we've got to revise i think that would be if you're willing and so able to do you want to i mean i'm happy to talk about that but i also i i'm sort of i was looking at natasha's question here which is about a concrete concrete question is there something it might be even better if we sort of i could talk through a little bit you want to give me like one of these concrete like one of these concrete questions i know i saw a few of them um i don't know natasha do you want should we unmute natasha and just see natasha do you have a specific question that might be useful to talk through? I would be delighted. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, what we're struggling with is uh, we have, um, uh, we've done a survey with our community, not as a sole determining factor, but to see where people are, if they would even show up for in-person services, should we make them available? There is a some significant number of people who are interested. We have a large sanctuary, six stories high, 1,300 seats, no air con- conditioning, uh, only like open windows and, and fans uh, type ventilation. Um, and we also, consider possibly outdoor services, which have their own set of worries about security, whatever, but let's talk about just the COVID question right now to to narrow it down. Um, We also know that a significant part of our services are uh, 
bound and grounded in activities that are high risk, like singing. Uh, sing singers are known as super spreaders. Uh, so I am the leader of the singing and there are congregants who would want to sing. Uh, how, how do we weigh, uh, you know, the sort of the aesthetics of the service that is, you know, very decentralized people and mask each in their own corner discouraged from singing versus, you know, halakhic value and, and other religious value of being together and uh, safety uh, and, you know, uh, of everybody involved, including the leaders and, uh, you know, you know what I mean? There's yep. so many mm -hmm. considerations, exactly. like how would we yep. think this through yep. that we are, you know, we have, we want to protect our people. We want to give them a meaningful religious experience. What, how would you go about thinking through yes. this? Okay. So I think that's a very good, I think it's a very good frame. So, um, so what I would say is, I think that this is a good example of where it is difficult to, um, of where it is, it is important to frame the, the question. And so, you know, you sort of outline like there's 50 different things that we could do. The first thing I would say is like, what are the two main things? Is it like one option is outdoor services with singing, one option is indoor, out, indoor services with no singing. Like what are the kind of range of, it could be more than two, maybe there's four different options, but very concrete. What are the four different things that you are considering doing? And then I think that there's, you know, in those frames, like what is the, how can, you know, how, can you mitigate risk? How much risk can you mitigate? To be completely frank, I think singing, having people singing in, even people sitting every other seat, we know that singing is kind of like being at a bar. Uh, and this is a high risk activity, even with masks on. It like, it just for whatever reason, this seems to be a source of some super, some super spreading. Outdoor is going to be safer than, than indoor. But I think in some sense, the, the first thing that you need to do is, is actually think about what are the four concrete things that you're, that you're doing. And then are you, and then when you sort of get down to this point of benefits, like, is it, uh, singing in a bar is the worst. Um, when you get down to this point of, of benefits, you know, think about given, given what you have feel you need to do to mitigate the risk, how large are the benefits? So is it actually, is there actually a strong benefit to your congregation in being together in a socially distanced outdoor way where nobody can sing? Is that, maybe that it does have a big benefit, or maybe you're going to say, you know what, if that's what we have to do, then we would rather be on, we would rather be on Zoom. And I think, so I don't know how helpful that is, but I think that in some sense, when hearing you talk, the first thing I think is like, we got to like, you, you got to narrow the sort of set of things, or the first step would be to narrow the set of possibilities that you're, that you're thinking about. And and you know, you you bring up a, a an interesting question. There was a, there was a a point that uh, that, that uh, somebody brought up, Stuart, in, in your response to to how Annie Duke talks about that you still got to risk the money, and you know if you lose, you still may lose. I think one of the challenges for a lot of our congregants is we want to have a, a large number of people have a most meaningful spiritual experience possible in the high holiness, however that's going to look like. And that's the wonderful reward. But I think that that we as rabbis who are uh, so deeply value human life, you know, what would happen if one or two of our congregants die because we wanted to have singing, right? And 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 you can't always necessarily know what's the direct link in this kind of way. So you know, how do we how do we deal with this level of, of, of uncertainty of also not knowing what led to this result, right? Like this is, you know, we're trying to figure out and, and, and obviously if we're saying we want to mitigate the risk, we don't want to lose any, we don't want any of our congregants to, to die because of this. And I think that's, that's an incredibly noble goal. And I also think that we know that people die and there are other people decisions that, you know, it's not just our decisions. It's when, you know, what are they doing with other communities in different places and different schools? And there's so many different confounding factors in many ways. How can we sort of emotionally accept this? So, so I don't want to sound glib, I think about this, but, but I would say at least at this moment, several, well, now a couple of months, at least before the high holy days, might be an opportunity to say, well, you know, there's more uncertainty around this pandemic or this plague than there ever has been in Jewish history because science has created all this uncertainty virtually by accumulating all this knowledge. It's, it's offered us bigger questions and more difficult questions. 
But why not take advantage of that time to say, well, what, what's the essence of the spirituality that we want? I mean, how do we combine this? Are there ways in which the service can be just as spiritual in silence? Can you hear the singing just as loud if it's absent? I mean, you know, there's always that issue of the, the whole makes the thing more more apparent, more clear. So I, I don't know, but I, but it seems to me you're far enough in advance not to have to make immediate decisions about inside and outside singing or no singing, but but look at lots of different possibilities, no? I mean, when do you really need to make a decision about whether this will be inside or outside? I think for a lot of people, they're, they, they, that, a lot I of people mean, are making that decision now. I think a lot of people, because there's, there's a lot of logistics that happen. I think, you know, that's, it's, it's almost like trying to open school, um, you know, and trying to be able to do that. There's, there's staff and there's, and, and trying to also communicate. I think there's, it's hard. There's, it, and that's the challenge that there needs to be a lot of lead up time and yet things may radically change. You may have to change on a dime with, with, uh, with mm -hmm. some of this information. Well, that, I mean, the situation that we have now requires, I think, you know, solutions that are not so apparent or not so obvious, perhaps, but require a kind of a, an alternative sort of thinking sometimes that, you know, there may, there may have to be other ways and, and one does these other ways. They may not succeed those other ways. I, I would rather see them not succeed by being a little less spiritually satisfying than not succeed by having people die. <laughs> that would be my personal preference. Well, this right. year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were a little less spiritually satisfying than that. Then we would know that these are the really critical things that make them spiritually satisfying, and we'll put them back in next year for sure. That would be a that would be a better loss, in my opinion, my humble personal opinion, than having people die. So I would err on the side of that. And you know, Emily, your your piece again this this morning, and and we'll send some of this information out um, over the next couple of days. But one of the things that you talked about in terms of school, of you've got to start by making a commitment and being able to say, this is what we're going to do. Because if you just say, well, maybe we can do this or maybe we can do that, it's very easy to opt out. And and in many ways, Judaism um, by restricting things actually opens up more opportunities. And being able to say, we're we're not doing this. We are not going to use electricity on Shabbat. Or we are not going to to um, go to work on this particular day. That actually opens up. Saying no to this allows yes for lots of other yeah. things. Um, and so I'd love for you to actually talk a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah. So when I was so I was writing this morning about schools and kind of like the logistics of opening schools, obviously is like re really big. Um, and and sort of I think the the first point to make there it was just that like if we're going to make that happen. And we have to say that we are going to have, have it happen. Like we have to, like you have to announce that you're going to do it. Because if you say we're thinking about it, you will not do it because it is too hard. And I think that announcing some decision then really restricts the set of things. And so then you can say, we're going to open schools. And then you can start talking about, okay, well, how are we going to do surveillance? And how are we going to do distancing? And how are we going to do masks? And who's going to wear masks? And all the other millions of sort of individual decisions. And you won't get to those decisions if you haven't decided to do something. So I think in this context, is sort of the same kind of thing. I mean, some of you may be thinking about this in the context of schools that you're running. Uh, and but I think the other thing is here. You know, if you say, okay, we're going to have we're going to have some kind of in-person services, we are committing to doing that. Then you can start thinking about what you know. What are the steps that you need to make that safe? Or you can say, we're not going to do that. We're going to have some kind of online services. And then you can think about how can we make that experience as spiritually fulfilling as possible in the constraints of it's going to be online. Um, and so I think that those, that sort of, that, whatever that choice is, I, in some sense, you know, I said, don't think too far ahead. This is probably not too far ahead, um, given how many decisions are going to need to be made, uh, before, before September. And I think once that first sort of pulling the trigger on that first decision, is then the key to unlocking sort of being able to do the to do the logistics. Um. Yeah, because that's that, you know we it's it's often easier to be able to to talk through the process and it, it but it's but it's scary, right? It's definitely it's a it's a scary thing to be able to say here's what here's what we're doing and here's why. Um, but I also think being able to I think probably a, a level of transparency also 
and and being able to say here's here's what the decision that we made and here's the thought process that went into it and 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 who was also part of that conversation because I think that's also got to be a a key piece of this also that that um, I think what I'm hearing from a lot of rabbis is is wait a second I, I I'm not an expert in these kinds of things and I'm being asked to task to to make these decisions and I don't know what the right decision is. So who are the other people to be able to talk to and to be able to say, who are the, who are the people who are expert in the kinds of decisions that we need to be thinking about? And this is, there's another, there's another question here that there's, there's also a a role that, um, that, uh, you know, that that politics and personality play into this also, because that's, you know, it's not just, um, it's not just COVID-19 and the epidemiology, but no, it's also no. how do you get people to behave in a reasonable kind of way? Yeah, no, no, I think it's really, I mean, I think there's a, there's a personality component, which you probably, you know, I think is, is something that, you know, people like individuals are going to make different choices about their, uh, their attitude towards risk. And I think that's, a, that's okay. Um, and in some sense, you know, we have to acknowledge people's, um, you know, that people have like, that people have different risk tolerances and different, even putting aside the fact that they have different actual circumstances and actual sort of risks, you know, some people are more afraid of this than others. I think we need to be respectful about those different different preferences. I think the politics piece is much more complicated. Definitely, do not want to. It's going to be complicated to reopen your your congregation and then have people fighting over whether they should wear masks. You know, it's going to be much easier to open. You know, like like everyone where I live is very comfortable with masks for whatever reason. Rhode Island has done like a very good job with masks. And I'm sure when the synagogue down the street reopens, it will be fine and everyone will wear, like, it'll be fine to get everybody to wear a mask. That's not going to be true for, for all of you. And I think that that's, um, you know, that's a, that's a hard piece. You do not want to have your services open and open with people like sort of at fisticuffs over, over mask wearing. And I think that, you know, sadly is the word I would use, uh, I would use, use for that as well. Um, you know, in, I mean, in part, this is just like, this is where we find ourselves. I'm not, Sure. Why? And, well, and Stuart, can you talk a little bit because you you talk really beautifully about ignorance and the difference between the ignorance of I don't know and I want to find out versus I'm not listening to the experts or I saw this on a YouTube clip and I will trust what Jenny McCarthy has to say about this or the meme that I got shared. How do we talk about the different levels of ignorance and how we respond to those kinds of different questions? Yes, well, I, I mean, I think that's one of the great misunderstandings of, in in the public arena with science today. Of course, I mean, there's scientific ignorance, which I think is is the ignorance of expertise of somebody who who knows what is known, but also knows what questions arise from what we know. I mean, that's always the nature of science. The best, I think, is actually a nice piece of poetry by E. e. Cummings, who says the most always the most beautiful answer that asks the best question. So, uh, so that's what we always hope for in science is an answer not that provides the final answer because we don't necessarily think there is one, but provides yet a new set of questions and more questions and but but better questions, more sophisticated questions. That of course is different than just a simple, you know, ignoring facts or ignoring data or pretending that something is different than it is or ignoring facts. I don't think there's anything wrong with facts. I like facts. I just don't think science is only about it accumulating facts that's one piece of it but it's what you do with those facts it's how you use those facts to ask new questions and and i i guess you know to some extent that takes a certain kind of intellectual courage to be willing to understand that just getting the facts is only going to lead you to more questions and that's good that's what you that's what you want and as emily said the the important thing is to come up with the right question as it were to formulate a question well. One of the things I fear we never, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent here, but one of the things that I fear we don't do well in education is teach people to formulate questions. We teach them to learn answers, but we never teach them how to formulate, properly formulate a really good question, which is not easy to do, as it turns out. And so to me, that's the fundamental difference. And and we misunderstand science when a scientist stands up and says, well, that's an issue that we just don't really know at the moment. Um, it could be this, it could be that. And Harry Truman was famous for one time for saying that he would, wanted somebody to get him a one-handed scientist because he was tired of having scientists come up to him and say, well, it's this, this, and that. But on the other hand, it could be this, this, and that, you know? So he said, please, 
find me a one-handed scientist. But there I, are no such things. I heard it as a, as a one-handed economist. I don't know if that's where, where oh, you're doing that. Oh, it could be that too. Who knows? <laughs> you know? Yes, you never know. Well, no. well, that that leads nicely to to you know sort of the conclusion um, because I, I want to let you know, let you all know that we're going to have another webinar in about two weeks called "When Facts Lead to Uncomfortable Truths and What We Can Do About It" with Professor Brian Nosick and Kaylin O'Connor. Um, Brian founded Project Implicit. If you may know about the implicit bias test, and he's talking talks a lot about what that actually does and uh, and what its limitations are. And, and uh, Kaylin wrote a book called "The Misinformation Age." And you know, as we're thinking about questions of the biases that we face and the unconsciousness and the and the political and the personal and the spread of fake news, and we also you know fight for racial justice and try to engage with people of different political persuasions and build on this conversation today. We'll send you a link for that. That's going to be um, uh, on July fifteenth. But I really want to thank our two presenters here, uh, Emily and Stuart, Professor Oster and Professor Firestein, for such a thought-provoking conversation to open more questions than to answer them, but hopefully a, a framework to be able to think about some of these kinds of questions. And hopefully, if it's OK, it, um, I think both of you are actually, you, we can people can find your email address uh, online, but we can include that there for, for follow-up questions, if that's OK. And, uh, okay. Um, and we'll include some links there. We're also going to send out um, a post-program survey in, in a couple minutes that's going to take you three minutes to be able to, to do that. Um, but I uh, also want to just give you a reminder that Sinai and Synapses does have an open grant opportunity for your community to explore Judaism and science, uh, to get $3,600 to be able to explore questions of Judaism and science. Feel free to reach out to us. You can reply to the, to the email um, but we'll send you a link for the webinar in about two weeks. And uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you to all of you who are doing incredible work trying to dream up the high holy days and trying to be able to make the best decisions that we can when there are things that we just don't know. And, and we're going to do the best we can. And thank you both for inspiration you. And, and some very practical questions to think about this. Thank you so much for doing this. High holy days. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to all. Right. All. all the best. Thank you.